business. Most of my career has been helping multinationals internationalize towards Asia. Um, and I've worked with you over the past couple of years because I created a course on uh, uh, managing multinationals across Asia and I've embedded X culture within it. Uh, and one of the challenges uh, I found with uh, students, uh, uh, whether those students are undergraduates, masters or exec ed, is uh, we all know you assign them to read something and they never do. They come to class and you expect that they've read it. Uh, and partly because it, you know, the, the, the most academic books are quite, quite dense uh, in terms of uh, uh, an ability to read, particularly for the uh, non-practiced uh, practitioner. Um, so uh, I thought I'd create something that would be uh, reflect um, experience, but be supported by academic theory that was accessible to students um, and that professors could actually leverage it as well. Um, I so uh, just when I, I actually went through the traditional book publishing uh, route the first time, and that's what caused me to say there's got to be a better way. <laughs> okay, I didn't realize the first one was with the publisher. Okay, <clears throat> I have the scars on my back too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but you know, it was relatively e easy. I I found um, to go through the process. You already have your um, your, your, you know, a, an account on Amazon, probably you, you're not all you're doing is creating and extending that account into Kindle publishing. Um, and uh, uh, but you, the onus is on you to make sure you have a proper manuscript. So, you know, you, while you the publisher could give you some help with uh, typesetting and the like um, and, and sort of editing. You got to make sure you've edited it well or get someone to help you do that. So, you, you know, you can't get away from that. But the, in terms of uh, um, the target audience for my book, um, it is very much students, business uh, executives, and um, uh, uh, professors that want to teach international business. Um, I, I, don't think we, I don't think we, we actually said what the title is. It's to build and manage multinationals <laughs> for sustained growth across Asia. Um, and, 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 and we would like to devote some more time to the book, either in the beginning or at the end, because it seems to me it might be an interesting, a good addition to many international business courses. So uh, I will not be surprised if many of our professors, ex culture professors or just IB colleagues, colleagues decided to add this book either as the main text or perhaps as an add on uh, reading. It's not extremely expensive, so it's definitely affordable as an additional book, perhaps. So uh, it may be a nice addition to the course readings list. Yeah, yeah. It, it was um, in terms of the title. Uh, number one, across Asia, so you know there is a bit more of an Asia focus. That makes it a bit more unique than the traditional IB text. Uh, number two, it's focused on multinationals, so uh, it does embed IB theory throughout it, um, but not necessarily from a neoclassical economics perspective. That is, tends to be a bit more focused on trade. It, this tends to be a bit more focused on internationalization. That is setting up and building um, sales offices or production facilities in, in foreign markets and the challenges in doing that. Um, and I say for sustained growth um, because, you know, my own PhD thesis was uh, uh, investigating Western multinationals in terms of their commitment and decommitment from Asia. Um, and what causes that? What are the successful practices? How do you sustain growth within Asia? Because 80 percent, what I found from my uh, uh, 12 case studies and uh, um, is that uh, basically about 80 percent of multinationals actually decommit um, over, over a period of time. They may recommit and sometimes they do it multiple times, which is perplexing. Um, but uh, yeah, it it's, uh, covers basically the context of Asia, the cognition the cultures and the various market economies across the 48 countries and three territories of Asia. It goes into talking about the internationalization process um, and the strategy for developing a process for developing an internationalization strategy, um, which they're actually, if you want to, if you look through a lot of the, the uh, ac academic uh, um, articles, there actually isn't uh, really a defined process like uh, like this, the uh, design the approach uh, for developing an internationalization it's 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 different than just saying a single market strategy and take and extending it for a multi-country market you need to actually develop a 
internationalization uh, strategy. And then it, there's a process of doing that. So the book goes through that. And then the book talks about the roles and interrelationships between the corporate headquarters, regional offices, and uh, got to take out water, and uh, um, country subsidiaries and uh, expatriates. So that's the context mm. of the book. Um, the way it was delivered is basically um, through, uh, I originally was through uh, LinkedIn posts and I've basically curated that. So basically you have uh, um, 1300 characters of a key concept, whether that is Uppsala model, um, whether that is the uh, uh, China civilization, uh, whether that is the uh, parenting of uh, corporate headquarters, 1300 characters and an image. And it's really um, aligned with the millennials of this day, day and age, who are focused, you know, who tend to respond to a social media interface and LinkedIn. All I've done is taken that and consolidate it into the book. Okay. So, so one goes to Asia, spends most of his life or much of his life there, learns about business in Asia, C collects all that information and experience. And then in your particular case, so the book is almost like a collection of short stories, then it becomes right. Or almost like uh, snippets where one doesn't have to read all thousand pages to get the full story. So you can go. So that's specifically useful for busy executives and busy businessmen, as well as busy and uh, um, not only busy, but also with a short attention span students. But mm. le let's say you have your content. So now it's all downloadable, all in whatever format, Microsoft Word, for example, or whichever other um, yeah. um, text editor you use. So how do you go from the manuscript, essentially, or from something on paper? Or, or on your computer to actually the book that you held at the beginning of this session? So, so the, the, the core is the manuscript. And the manuscript, no front matter, no back matter. Uh, um, the, you strip out the bibliography. Um, that is what basically is uploaded into a program that you can get from, from uh, Kindle called Create Kindle. Uh -huh. and so that resides with the laptop. So let me clarify that. So Kindle or Amazon, they use their own software for processing that. It's not like you create a PDF and you upload it, right? It's different. No, no, no. Can you explain uh, that more? That's a, that's a traditional way. You can, you know, create a full uh, PDF with the front matter, back matter, but then you got to figure out how do you make it conform into the uh, Kindle format, mm -hmm. uh, and that's a challenge. So what the Create Kindle does, um, it basically formats it uh, to be accepted. Uh, onto your, basically onto your tablets. Right? And it works uh, only on Amazon Kindle reader or it can be read by other readers as well? And so Kindle will create the, for, uh, Amazon will create the format. You, you know, once you get it into the Kindle format, you know, they can actually uh, tra transfer it into the other formats for other publishers, um, or, you know, other, other types of tablets. Um, I know that on the website, it will show you all the various tablets uh -huh. that uh, it's, it will work on. I know on my phone, I have a Kindle app. So I do have a Kindle device, but on yeah. my phone, I have like a Kindle app that essentially simulates Kindle. And I think the app is free. So as long as right. I have the book, I can read it on any device, essentially just add an app. But you can, have uh, that app on your, you can have that app on your laptop too. Yeah. Okay. So, but how do you can, is it, is it a difficult process from the IT point of view? Like, let's say your original text, I assume was in Microsoft Word, right? Probably. Yeah. So is it difficult to, for someone without the IT experience to um, transpose or to. So, so the process is you, you basically upload it and, uh, in, or you, you up, upload it into the app uh, and that's it. Uh, I'll awesome. tell you it's a bit more involved in that, but I'll, uh, you know, that's, that's basically. Um, so the way that you can see the Create Kindle app basically looks at, first, give me your manuscript. That's what I want. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, this Create Kindle, you can do some basic editing into it, but don't do much. It's, it's not like Word. It doesn't have all that functionality. You do not want to do a lot of editing into it. Um, but, you know, I, I did some, uh, and you can get away with that. Um, but uh, yeah, you, you, you know, I basically used a, a style for my, my chapter header, a style for my uh, um, section headers, you know, so multiple uh, 
uh, chapters uh, uh, go into a, into an overall part or section of the book. You know, your book has three parts or four parts, and then they, each part has multiple chapters. Uh, and then the rest is normal text. Figuring out how you want to do the text in terms of do you want an indentation and, and all those aspects. But you should do that all in your uh, um, in your word processor, and then you upload that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So once that's in your Kindle. You can then, uh, in, in the uh, Create uh, Kindle app, you can then copy and paste your front matter in. Um, so there'll be, you know, um, the, the program basically has your contents page, you know, and, and that they, you, they will give you some text. And you have to watch the, that, that's the only one you really have to watch is the, uh, um, not the contents page, the uh, copyright page, sorry, the copyright page, because that's, that's the first page. Um, and it puts the dates and uh, it does give you an ISBN number, but that ISBN number is a dummy number. Make sure you change that at the very last step before you upload, uh, before you upload it. And you, if it's just an ebook, there's no ISBN number, you just delete it. But if you also produce a physical book, you should copy the ISBN from that physical book and just put it in your ebook so that if anyone's looking at it as an ebook, they, they can reference it uh, with the ISBN number. Um, the preface, you just copy and paste from another document what your preface is. So, you know, the same thing for the introduction, if you have any acknowledgments, um, you know, so all these sections, if you want to add in additional, a non-standard uh, front matter, you just add that in. You can add as many as you want and you can uh, position it where you want. So you have all your front matter, then you go into your uh, manuscript with all the chapters. And the reason it wants the Typically, your front matter looks a bit different than your chapters. All the chapters have to have the same exact structure. You look at any book, it has the same structure. So that's why I suspect that uh, um, Amazon does it this way. And then the same with the back matter. I do uh, have my, I, I, when I'm creating my manuscript, I do get my, I uh, use EndNotes. It uh, does produce uh, my bibliography at the end. Um, I just copy that bibliography, strip it out of the manuscript and put it into a separate document. Uh -huh. And then later on, I just copy and paste it and it just formats right. That right makes, in. Sense. Yeah, makes sense, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then, okay, so, th so then uh, I hit a button and, and say publish. And what the Create uh, Kindle program does, it just creates a file, okay, with a, a KDC file uh, um, suffix. Um, then, okay, so you, you basically have your um, raw manuscript done, including the front and back matter. Okay. You know how it looks because in the program, you can actually, it, it can show you through a simulation of what it looks like on your Kindle, on your, on your on a tablet, whether it's going this way or that way. One and it question. Shows you how it flows from page to page. One question, how does it work with, um, uh, with graphics? Can you add like diagrams or pictures? Okay. So the, the graphics, um, I had 144 images in mine because I oh. had, uh, you know, basically a, a page of text and then an image. Uh, you need to put that in, um, uh, you don't upload that. You, you, you add each one in as a JPEG. Um, so I had to go through the 144 pages and add it exactly where you, where I wanted it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you just say insert graphic, you grab it, you know, you grab it, uh, the JPEG file and insert. But it does allow graphics to be added to text as well. Oh yeah. Yeah. And you know, it basically allows you to position it. You can say, do you want to take the whole page, uh, a third of the page, uh, it, it basically has to be a floating graph. So that's the reason they do it that way, I believe, is it has to be a floating graphic. Because on if you have it in, in landscape mode and then turn it this way, that graphic's going to change. Right, 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 yeah. So they, they have this, uh, the, the, the coding done to allow, you know, you've shown wh where you want to position relative to a particular text element. And then it figures, you know, and then you say, that's where I want my graphic. And then it figures out, where it's positioned on the page, whether it has to go on to the next page, um, because you need a quite a bit of uh, fle uh, flexibility. 
Right. And remember that you can have this on here, or it may end up being looking out on my little phone. Exactly. Right? A different screen shape. Yeah. yeah. Um, Gordon, there are questions already coming from our um, listeners or viewers. And uh, right. thank you so much, Miguel, that you took the, the first step here. So everybody, if you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A window. And then uh, also feel free to raise your hand and we can add you so you can uh, participate in the discussion here as well. But so uh, Miguel is asking, can you tell us more about the front matter and the back matter, what that is? Uh, so okay. uh, and that, to be honest, I'm, uh, yeah. yeah, I'm not quite sure either. Are you talking about the table of contents and pre preface or something more? Okay, so so the, the, the front matter is everything, the front and back matter is everything that's not in the core manuscript, the chapters. So that's, that starts off with your, you have a title page, which is really the same as your cover. It's uh, then your copyright page, um, your, your uh, um, preface, your praise of the author. Uh, you can have an author page. Um, some of these, it's your choice, can be in the front or the back. Acknowledgements. You know, there's, there's some variability. Um, but obviously the table of contents. Now, Amazon, when you, when you see it in the... Um, uh, loaded in uh, create Kindle, you'll see every chapter in there, you know, the, and, and it'll have, and it'll, you'll see the, the chapter header, um, and that will create the table of contents. It automatically creates the table of contents. You can override some of the aspects. I didn't, I just let it create the table of contents because that way, when you click, when you're reading it and you click the uh, uh, particular line, it'll jump to that page. You don't get page numbers on the ebook, you do get page numbers on the physical book. Mm -hmm. A few more technical questions. So there is a question about the graphics of the title page. Uh, do you design that yourself? Uh, do you have freedom as to what it looks like? Okay. So what? Okay. So, um, okay. so um, what you can. So I did have to. So you ha you have your manuscript. You create your 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 uh, front and back matter. You do have to create a cover. Um, you create the cover online. Um, you know when you upload the when you upload it to Amazon. You, you upload the manuscript and then you basically create a cover or upload a cover. Okay. Um, you can, you can um, just use that, let Amazon create a cover and it gives you some basic designs and basic textual formats and you just put in the title and the author name and, and the like. Um, I thought that was kind of bland. I wanted to put in, you see the picture behind me? Yeah. That's what I wanted as my cover. Uh -huh. <laughs> so if you look at my book, that's my, that's where it comes from. The picture behind me, which can came you show from the yeah. actual book one more time. What? Can you show the actual book one more time for the comparison? Yeah. So what did come? There you go. Aha. Uh Aha. -huh, uh -huh. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's, it, it was, um, uh, I just took a, a photo, you know, and cleaned it up. And then, uh, basically, uh, um, from the, uh, Kindle, it will give you a template. You can use a template which shows you uh, uh, how many, given how many pages your book is. So if it's just an ebook, you don't have to worry about thickness. It's just about six, mine six inches by nine inches, which is a standard format. Um, so you can you can just use that standard format. They have lots of different sizing you can do. Um, it does give you guidance that you have to have a margin on each side and then the center margin. Um, you have to have a bit of wiggle room. And then it calculates what your uh, what's your uh, um, cover page sizing should be, and then you just have to make sure your graphic fits in there, and you drop in your your uh, your own words like your title and your your author and how you want it to look. Um, so a lot of people just let let uh, Kindle automatically create it. Um, I wanted my own look, um, and I just follow the template. When you create, if you do a physical book, um, you have to. Uh, um, they give you an estimate of the number of pages when you create the physical book. Um, so that tells you, and then you can just uh, enter that into their, their template mask, which ends up being a uh, just an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, and it tells you uh, how thick it is, uh, and, uh, uh, and it creates a, a template, that, uh, which is a PDF that I just uh, overlay on, on uh, PowerPoint. Uh, Gordon, cool. there is a question from Karen Linden, and I'm actually kind of interested in that too. Um, why that photo? What it means uh, wanting to see some behind the scenes story. So uh, what does it mean? Why did you choose that one? So that's, that's one page in my front, front matter about the cover. Um, uh -huh. they, you know, there's both a sentimental value because I, I actually went to Jeanne. It's the, uh, um, 
it represents the um, uh, uh, the terracotta soldiers, which was the first Chinese emperor uh, of China. You know, who you know based his base all the way back in uh, 221 BC, uh, and you know, and then he had terracotta soldiers. And I went there, and I went there with my uh, mother and my father, and I took them down the Three Gorges. So there was, you know, but I I saw this picture there, and I bought it. Um, so the, you know, so there's that there's that aspect. The other aspect is it's bamboo, and that's very symbolic. Uh, it's symbo you know, you see bamboo, you think of Asia. It's also uh, a very hardy um, um, uh, uh, tree uh, grass. It, you know, it grows and it doesn't break. It it flows with the wind, and you got to do that when you build a business in Asia. You got to be able to flow with the wind, it, 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 so it has solid root structure, and it adapts to its environment. Uh, and so I thought that was a good analogy for if you want to build a business in Asia, you know, just be like a bamboo. <laughs> so. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, so you have your graphics just to be sure then. So it sounds like it's not that difficult once you have the content in, let's say, Microsoft and a collection of yeah. uh, JPEG pictures. From there, from that point on, you kind of upload, check, upload, check, make some little yeah. changes if needed. But it sounds like it's sort of like wheezy wig. What you see is what you get. And it's yeah. more so, so, like so you so just get in your mind. You first create the book on your laptop using their their uh, their program, and then when you upload it, you have basically three sections. The first section is all about your um, your own details, uh, like your personal details. Um, where you want your royalties paid, what's your bank account number so it can electronically transfer royalties. If you're overseas, you have to uh, do your uh, WBEN form and uh, to minimize your tax withholding. So that's sort of the, all the, the logistics matter. Then it's sort of give us your manuscript, give us your cover, um, what, are your key, what are your keywords, how do you categorize it? Um, and, uh, and then you can say um, preview it online. Okay. Now the ebook, you already looked at it on Craig Kindle, but I also look at it online. Uh, the physical book you want to look at online because the physical book doesn't really, uh, isn't really represented like on, on the Crate, uh, Crate Kindle app on your laptop. It's really just doing for an ebook. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The print book though, you may have, you may want certain pages to be blank because you always want, uh, like I had to do that because I always wanted my text on the left page and the image on the right page. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so I had to make sure the chapter started in the right place. Um, so, you know, I put in some extra blank, blank pages. So, uh, and so I just flowed through it and made sure it all lined up. So you, you look, so you can look at it online as well uh, as if it was a physical book. So we have a little bit more questions here about technical issues. So, uh, print book. So you created electronic copy. Where does the print book comes from? Do they create an automatically copy for you? Do you have to pay extra for that? How does it work with the physical? So, okay. So let's let's talk about what we're on the we're on the uh, online on the website. Uh -huh. Okay. It's, it's the author website now. K, uh, K, they they call it KDP. Um, there you load in and you you get your trick. You know, it's a, they ask you, are you doing what are you doing first? Are you uploading? Are you uploading an ebook first, or are you uploading a print book first? Okay. If and I, you know, it's your choice. I uploaded a, an ebook. Um, that was the first thing, um, and it took all those details. When I finished my ebook, it says, "Do you want to create a, a physical book now?" Okay. Amazon so, asks you that directly, yeah, right? So yeah, yeah. And it associates the, the the two books together then when it shows up on your listing. Uh -huh. So uh, the the one advantage with the uh, doing an ebook is, and this is what I did. What I did is you can say, uh, so you know today's what the ninth or whatever. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wa I want my book available. It's gonna be avail available on December twenty first. So the ebook you can pre order an ebook by uh, for and and on December twenty first you can down it'll be downloaded to you. Um, you, you can't do that with the physical book, um, but uh, um, so I didn't, I didn't have my book done yet. I had to ensure that five days before that date, my manuscript was uploaded. If it's not, uh, Amazon says it's going to banish you for a year because it's taking pre-orders. 
right? It's, you know, people are already giving money for the book and expecting it to come down. Um, so, uh, yeah, so it's, so you can do that with an ebook. Okay. So I created an ebook first. Um, can we talk about the pre-order date? So do you have to specify the pre-order date or can you just say, well, no, it will be available to. whenever I'm done? Yeah. Yeah. You can just do that. And, you know, and then you say, make, make available now. So why did you self-imposed a pre-order day, uh, date? Well, of well I, I did that. It was at the end of my course, uh, which was, uh, in November. And I said, by the way, class, the, uh, if any of you are interested, my new book is going to be available on December. Uh, I originally had December 11th. I actually released it December 7th. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so you can move up a pre, you can move, you can change your date, move it up as long as you give that five day window. So the original release date would have been tomorrow, right? Yeah, yeah. But it's up, it's been up for a while, for a few days now, a week uh -huh. now. Okay. Because it just because I finished it earlier than I thought. Okay, okay. So it asks you, do you want to create a physical copy? You, you click yes. What happens then? Who pays for the print? How does it work? Okay. So, um, yeah. So, uh, yes. And you have to then get, you know, give a full cover, not just the front page, which would be on ebook. You need the full front and back. Um, and the middle, I guess, right? Too. And the middle. Yeah. And that's where the sizing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, um, so after, uh, uh, I'm trying to think. What, what, what happens next? Well, you have to give a, the, how do you want it distributed? Are you going to make, distribute it exclusively through Amazon? And I, that's what I did. Um, you know, they can distribute it through, so people with other e-readers could read it. Um, other bookstores besides Amazon, but you get much lower um, um, royalty. And I figure Amazon has the biggest distribution. Why not just go for uh, 90 days uh, um, exclusive with them? Mm -hmm. You then uh, um, confirm your your uh, royalty, um, and uh, let, let me just so I get the figures right. Um, so uh, for the ebook, the royalty is thirty five percent. There is for a children's book. There's ability to uh, have if you're going to price your book less than ten dollars, uh, they'll raise that to sixty percent. But your book has to be less than ten ten dollars. Um, uh -huh, so. More, let, let's just re reiterate that. So if you publish an, an ebook with Amazon, um, every time it's sold, let's say, for example, the price is $10 just to keep it round. Yeah. So, well, so, no, no. so 10, if it's $10, you can get a 60% below uh -huh. 10. If you over that, or, let, let's go with my book. My, uh -huh. my book is $34.95. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I get 35% royalty on that. So it's tw I get $12.23. From every copy sold. That's every actually copy. very good. So again, I'm not sure what people expected to hear for the number here. But um, as I said, when you publish with a regular publisher, you usually get somewhere from what I understand from my research, you get somewhere between two and 5%. Yeah, it's so very low. We, yeah, when we got 5%, everybody will say like, wow, that's so cool. I mean, how did you, you know, did you twist their arms? And I, yeah. I said, well, no, that's what they offered. Is it much or not? Because I thought it's nothing. And everybody says, actually, that's very good because normally they don't give you that much. Usually they get yeah. like 2 3%. That's it. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so 35, the, that's like 10 times. 35 on the ebook. On the print book, it's 60%. Less, uh -huh. less your print charge. Uh-huh. So can you, can you tell how much that print charge might be? Yeah. So you, you it will give you the estimate. You add, it asks you, uh, is going to be in color, black and white. In my case, so my, my, my book, the print charge was uh, in color, $26.89, so $27. Black and white was about $6. Uh-huh. Then it's not I, too bad. Yeah. So, but you know, I, my, my images are all color. Excuse me. I got to blow my nose or... You can edit this out. <laughs> so the, the print is so just to go. So you pay a one-time fee of uh, a few dozen dollars for the cover, and then six dollars per copy per one. You said six dollars. No, 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 no. So I, I like so ebook. It's it's basically you download it. I'll you know it's the, the person pays uh, thirty five dollars and I get twelve dollars. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. If they order the book to be physically delivered to them. Um, They'll, they'll pay uh, the, the cost of the book and I'll get 60% of that cost. Now, less the print charge. So let's just take my case. Uh -huh. I, I, I decided, you know, so I'm, I'm printing in color because all my images are color. Um, so I have $27 of, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, of uh, print charge. Um, but I, I just basically doubled the price of my book. 
So, but is it is it twenty seven dollars? Is it a one time charge or it's per copy? Oh, no, it's uh, uh, per copy because they print on demand. Uh huh. So it is uh -huh. a Got long it. production run. It's print on demand. Uh huh. Got it. If you wanted to get a couple hundred copies for yourself to let's say give out to your friends and family, uh, how much would you pay for those copies then? You're you're charged for the print cost and delivery. So it will cost you what about thirty three dollars or something like that. Yeah, well, so it cost me the $27 plus the delivery charge. If you're in the States, it's a lot cheaper. Um, getting it delivered here, I get. I think it's about another $4 per buck is the uh, delivery charge. And so how much did you I'm price? Of, yeah. <laughs> so how much did you price your your, your physical books? Uh, so it's 34 for the electronic copy. How much is it for the... So, so it's 30, yeah, 35. Let's go even numbers. It's $35 for the uh, 34.95, but $35 for the ebook. And I just doubled it. So, uh -huh. so it's basically uh, seventy dollars for the uh, uh, physical book. Um, and so, when you sell a physical book, my, what? When you sell the physical book, how much is staying in your account? Then you said oh, it's so about. I get fifteen, I get about 15 mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So in the end, it's almost the same. You know, doesn't really matter that much which which version you sell. Yeah, yeah. if you had a black, uh, black and white print, um, mm -hmm. you know, that's another twenty dollars you would have got. Uh huh. So that's a big difference. Again, good to keep in mind when people are creating the graphics. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very interesting. All right. And so, and then once you set those little details up, you just basically click publish and then wait for and the. Then, so then Amazon, Amazon, they need the five days. They actually have someone look at your book. Um, so I, you know, they they said, well, my this is how I found out on my fifth when I with my physical book. They said. It has the wrong ISBN number on the uh, copy on the copyright page because you get assigned uh, an ISBN number when you create a physical book, uh, but you are the one that has to physically then go back, put it into your manuscript, upload the new manuscript. Mm -hmm. so it's slightly convoluted that way. There is an interesting question also from Professor uh, Savita Gautam from India. Uh, she's asking about the number of pages. So you gave all those numbers and that's your book. It saw, lo looked like about what, 350 pages or so based on? I, I, I'm, I'm, I have got my, I just published my book last week. Uh -huh. And it takes, it's going to take about three weeks before the first run and I get my book. So I just put the cover on an existing ah, So it's only the cover. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but, but, so, but how does uh, all that changes when you add more pages? Is it more or less for the print or it's a fixed Oh, yeah. Price? Yeah. So it, it's, it's priced on number of pages. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh -huh. the bigger the book, the more, the, the more, more charge you have. Uh, my book is um, about 300, uh, about 300, uh, on, on the, the estimate 300, 378 pages. Uh, I was almost right on. So, okay. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, so for the electronic copy, I assume number of pages doesn't matter, but for the hard copy, depending on the size, yeah. it may be a little bit more for the print charges. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The only thing that's on the electronic copy is there's a bit more for the, obviously the user download time. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then also um, um, for the audio version, if you wanted to create one, I'm an avid audio listener. So it looks yeah. like this year I will approach about 80 books in the year. And so I really love electro I mean, audio because I don't want to just sit down and read. I want to do something and listen. So if you wanted to create your own audio version, would that be an option? It, there, there is the capability and option for it. I have not investigated it yet, uh -huh. but I know it, 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 it does exist there. You know, so they obviously have to. Um, I don't know if they use a uh, uh, a computer to 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 do the first pass, and then some some or or someone actually goes through it. Um, but there is a cost to, to creating it. Uh, I can say from my experience, for those who might want to consider the audio option, I don't know how it works with Amazon, but just creating the audio file. Uh, so I've tried two different versions. One. Um, uh, you can go on websites like Upwork. And so there are many, many, uh, so it's it's a kind of freelancer website for all kinds of creative services. And so there is a whole section there for the voice actors and you can hire them. Uh, you can look at their work, listen to their prior work. And uh, the prices are very different. So they're all around the world. Uh, usually you can get much cheaper services from, for example, outside the United States. Uh, so, but that will be done very professionally. So it will be really done professionally. I also experimented with using 
in my own students, um, I've uh, used four, I believe, over the years, maybe five, oh, four students and one professor. And so they have very nice kind of radio voice, you know, like the proper, you know, the voice that instills trust and, you know, easy to understand. But to my surprise, out of five people I worked with, only one was very good. So uh, all the other ones, th when they talk, it sounds very pleasant. But when they start reading, turns out that the, you know, intonation, spa pacing, you, you have to be trained in that. And so there was one who was very good at that. And so he was willing to do it virtually for free, just for fun. I'm not sure if you'll find someone like that. I'm not sure if my uh, student would still be available, but I suppose just creating the audio file, if you have you know, a better microphone, uh, it, it should be okay. For example, when we recorded some uh, back, um, what do you call it, the voice track for the Xculture videos, those whiteboard animations, what we did was um, our campus has a whole recording studio and it's available to faculty for free. So I had to book it a few days in advance, but they had professional microphones, full you know, soundproof. And so that allowed us to create those audio files. And I assume the same thing would be available for the, for the professors. But my question, so it sounds like you, you Gordon, you say you didn't explore it. So once you have the MP3 file, it should be as easy as just click and upload, or there may be some more complicated process there. Yeah, I, I, I would have to investigate that and get back to you. I don't, I don't, uh, I, I haven't played with it yet. Um, so I don't want to give the wrong information. Got it. Okay. Okay. Um, so um, uh, there are the one, more... the one other thing to consider is um, mm -hmm. um, one of the other reasons I, I went with, with decided to attend the list because when I want to do a new version, so. I'm constantly updating my teaching materials, my content, and the way I've structured the book, because it's basically 144 concise posts, basically, across 14 chapters. Um, I can add posts anytime. Um, I can add content every time, anytime, right? So all I'll do is I'll create at the end of the next term, I'll just create a new version. And that, that's what I wanted to ask. So if you wanted to create like edition two, so you just uh, add content to the existing book and publish it as edition two, right? Correct, correct. And so, you know, and you just say, that you'll have to add a line saying this is version two, you know, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting. Um, so a few more questions in terms of technicalities. Um, one, in terms of ownership, how does it work? So who owns the content? Does it become now property? Aha, uh -huh, so unlike with regular publishers where you have to Absolutely. relinquish all rights, yeah. here you remain the owner. So yeah. if you decided, for example, tomorrow, let's say, for example, tomorrow, another publisher approaches you and says, Gordon, we love this book so much. It fits so well with our mission. So they offer you a better deal or for whatever reason you decided. To, so you then just stop this distribution through Amazon? Well, so I, I, I've done a nine, 90 day. So in the first 90 days, I can't. Yeah. Um, outside but, it's of not, but it's not in perpetuity. So it's something that just, yeah. again, uh, I'll share with you one story. Maybe it would be interesting to you, Gordon, but also to the listeners here. Um, so at my department, um, when I was hired, in fact, one of the reasons why I chose this university, we had a professor, um, Paul Muchinsky. And so Paul um, was, is the, or was the author. He died, sadly, a couple of years ago. But um, he's the author of the most popular uh, industrial organizational psychology textbook. And uh, so I, I think now it's like in addition 14 or 15. So so literally with hundreds of thousands of, uh, you know, over the years, because it's been around for decades now. And so um, originally it was published, I don't know who was the publisher, but it was, you know, with one of these academic publishers. And so after like six editions, I believe he said, no, that's enough. I mean, it, it, it's, it's so popular and I'm literally getting nothing. And so he decided to go the self-publishing route. And so he literally had to buy out the rights to his book. I don't know mm -hmm. how expensive the deal was, but he said it was a huge amount of money that he needed to pay to the publisher to have the right from now on to publish new editions on his own. So he eventually bought out those rights, set up a separate company, and then now it's been published. Well, as I said, he died now, but I think his daughter is in charge and uh, his co-author or, or somebody took over the whole process. But then once he was fully in charge, that's where he started seeing some serious money and uh, you know enough to set up a company, hire employees. In fact, one of our university employees fully transferred to work for him instead. So that's where he started seeing some serious uh, cash and so as a textbook, I assume it was about a hundred something dollars per copy. And so that's, you know, so a huge difference depending on how you publish in that respect. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I don't want, if, if you have a simple book, I think Kindle is a better way to go. Mm -hmm. If it's yeah. more complex and you want to have a lot of interactivity, and that's what the publishers, the traditional publishers are trying to do is have more interactivity, as you know, uh, for the eBooks and the like. Um, 
it's you, you don't get that with the Kindle. The Kindle is a um, a base a basic book with graphics, uh, but you know you don't have the that you can display on the ebook or in physical book. But you don't have the level of interactivity that you do on some of the new traditional publisher software. You know whether it's McWill uh, Williams or whatever. Can you still embed uh, hyperlinks to websites? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So the hyperlinks show uh, are, are in the ebook. Uh, you know, uh, so, so that's not a problem. Then that's perfect. So we actually worked at some point, never published, by the way, but maybe we should go back and publish it with one of our professors, a book on kind of, we called it country guides. So presumably it would have been, you know, a guide to countries as people, let's say you go on a business trip to, let's say China, and yeah. you didn't do your research, but you want to kind of catch up on your flight. So you just download China and you read that chapter as you're flying. And so, yes, we used one of those more advanced um, electronic editors where you had interactive charts, where you had some, you know, pronunciation, but as long as you have a hyperlink, you can actually take people yeah. directly to the website and just yeah. put it on your website. You don't really need yeah. to have you know, that natively embedded in the book itself. Yeah. Um, there is a very interesting question here from Dina, one of our professors, um, about sort of academic credit. So when you publish this book, how does it work? And it may be different from institution to institution, but you still want to have it on your resume. I mean, it's still, yeah. as academics, we have to publish or perish and you yeah. know, it's all about yeah. peer-reviewed articles. Uh, can you tell us more about self-published books? How does it do you get any recognition credit other than the royalties? Well, you, you know textbooks, it's not peer reviewed. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you, you're not getting, you, you're getting, um, now, you know, you will get credit for creating a practice oriented, you know, uh, um, uh, text that you can also use for teaching, uh, but it doesn't have the same value uh, in terms of academic credentials relative to an FT50 uh, journal article. Um, of, course, of course, but still, but let me specify that question. So you talked about ISBN. And so usually sort of ISBN is uh, the marker, you know, the difference between a, uh, you know, a, a blog post on your website uh, versus yeah. a real book that you can show your parents and say, hey, see that I published a book. Yeah. And so you said for the electronic one, they give you, as you said, a dummy ISBN, but then for the real one, for the paper one, they give you a real one. So is yeah. that something that Amazon handles for you? Do you pay extra for that? How does oh, it no, It's automatic. When, when you see a print book, you, you get your ISBN assigned. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. So that, that's fine. They have, um, I think it's a, a different ABSN or something for the electronic books. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm for reference but uh yeah yeah they it's a 13 digit isp unassigned um they don't they don't uh go and get you a library of congress number an mm -hmm. loc number yeah uh, you would have to do that or or get someone to do that but Is nobody that, you know, no one refers to that generally you know we although some of the library systems may 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 look for an loc number but uh the isp number is the uh, the key one Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but in any case, yeah, as long as you have that, that's like a reference to a paper. And so, yeah. uh, yes, books, because they're not necessarily peer reviewed, I guess they don't carry the same weight at some institutions as, uh, as you said, FT50 papers, but then at other, in some disciplines, books, that's what counts. So they, yeah. they actually look at books, not at papers. Uh, I know that my friends in geography and history, I had one, um, uh, uh, roommate back in Canada, he, he specialized in military history of Canada. So they published books. And when I tell, told him we have to publish papers, he said, who cares about a paper? Just a few pages. You yeah, write yeah. a monograph, you know, a thousand pages, you know, research that you do on some battle somewhere, you know, the Canadian military was engaged in. So I guess for them, that's the way to go then. So, so, so for me, it, it counts because I'm, I'm a, a practice professor, um, you know, and so I, I don't have as, I don't have to produce as many journal articles. I just have to engage with business. So th this is really a, a, an integrated business academic text. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, you know, I've really structured to make it, make it that way, that a business person wants to read, you'll see on the, uh, the phrase for the book, I do have advice towards the uh, um, coming from business executives first, and then I have yourself and, you know, and students singing the phrase of the book um, uh, and the positioning of it in, 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 uh, on Amazon. It's more to hit the business audience because a yeah. student is going to uh, be driven by the professor, um, and you know, and, and the, for me, I was mainly concerned about using it for my students, but I recognize other professors will may want to teach this course. It's unlike any other IB, IB course. I looked at all the IBIM uh, books, 
Um, and they followed with quite similar structure. And this is a, quite a difference because it goes into the mechanics of the multinational and Asia. Yeah. Yeah. What, one uh, issue to consider here, if you want to publish a book to use in your own class, I know that um, at least at the American institutions, uh, you always have to go through this kind of conflict of interest review process. And so if you sort of push your own book on your own students, uh, nothing wrong with that, you can do that for sure. But there will be, at least at our school, I know there will be some sort of review you making sure that you're not trying to sort of make some buck on, you know, on your students. So well, I, I, you just have to explain that, yes, you know, I couldn't find an existing book and uh, I decided to write one myself. And so, and then it's okay, but, but there will be some step when someone looks at it to make sure that you are, you know. Oh, you, you recognize, and you, you know, that, but the rest of the audience doesn't know, this is a, this is a uh, part of a broader uh, program um, where a lot of the content is actually published on LinkedIn. So yeah. my students, it's sort of, it's all out there on LinkedIn. As well as well as, um, so you just get there, or if you want, it's entirely optional for you to uh, have the book, uh, if you want to buy the book. Yeah. And the reality, as I've told you in the past, is you don't make money out of writing books. It's, it's, the book is really for credentials. Yeah, let's do some quick math. math. Uh, so if you make, let's say, about $15 per copy in your case. So if you sell 1,000 copies over the life of the book, that's what, about $15,000 minus taxes, minus whatever. So it will not make you rich. It will not probably make a huge difference in your, but it's already something. I mean, it's, you know, it's basically, you know, depending on where you teach. So it's an equivalent of one to two courses of teaching. And yeah. so if you think about that, that it takes some time to teach a course, why not maybe spend that time and write a book? And I really, really love the idea. And by the way, for those who are listening, so we will have another meeting um, if, in a few days with Gordon, where we will specifically yeah. talk about the use of LinkedIn in teaching. But so what I really like about your approach is that you essentially kind of published a few pages of that book in the form of, of posts on LinkedIn. And then you just consolidate all of that and basically you have a book. And so that's the way to go. So, I mean, first it's easier to read it that way, but then also, uh, you know, easier to self-discipline and, and, and get it published. So why not? I mean, you know, if you have a collection of publications like that, you know, put it together, maybe add a little bit more sort of meat to it, but yeah, why not? So, yeah. and yes, while you may not get, get rich on it, it does give you some recognition. You can maybe, you know, if you do some consulting on the side, perhaps it gives you some credibility. Uh, it may give you some new clients. Uh, the students respect you more. So it seems to be, you know. Uh, there is a question again from Dina. She says she's heard if you get the book reviewed by another academic or academics, some institutions may count that as a peer reviewed uh, work. So did you try uh, you know, soliciting sort of unbiased uh, external reviews. I've, I've just released it. That yeah, that's my next step. You know, uh -huh, this, okay, is all moved, this is small moves. This is small moves. You know, we had the COVID. I started doing the LinkedIn posts and, and that teaching method, which raised the uh, uh, retention and absorption of the knowledge. Uh, and then I said, well, you know, I said, why don't I just consolidate it yeah. and create the book? And now I've done that. Now I'm at the next step. And no one had been using Kindle, so you know. It, I'm doing a lot of new things. And uh, so, yeah, that's the next step. Um, that's why I ordered the print copies because it's going to go to the Dean and uh, see, see what he'll do with it. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay, got it, got it, okay. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more about, so you have it published in terms of promotion. I know you're big on sort of strategizing um, uh, promotion and uh, kind of roll out uh, from uh, soliciting perhaps some reviews as you just mentioned, but also targeting the right audience. So are you planning to do something big to sort of to, to increase the sales or, or you just put it on Amazon and see what happens? So, so it's on Amazon and then I, I create, obviously, um, I'm, I'm, I'm connected with a lot of international business organizations, uh, you know, a Asia Link Business in Australia or Asia Society, uh, which is in the US and in, in uh, uh, Australia and Hong Kong. Um, so on the business network, the, the trade, the uh, uh, trade commissions. Um, so who needs help in figuring out how to internationalize towards Asia? So, so I, it, I'm leveraging, remember, I've been in this uh, business for 30 years, right? So I have a pretty big network uh, yeah. within the business community. Um, so I, you know, even going through the, um, uh, the board certification program. So Singapore Institute of Directors, Australian Institute of Directors, as uh, company directors, institutes in, in the States and Canada. Um, I, you know, boards need to understand 
how to engage into Asia. So I'm going through that route. Um, on the academic, yeah, I, I've sent, you know, we'll, uh, trying to go through AIB and I'll, uh, uh, they, they do reviews of books once in a while. Um, and, um, I'm, you know, and, and I'm going through uh, uh, my library, the library system here is, is promoting it. Uh, my former alumni uh, university, University of Sydney, they're promoting it. Um, so I'm let, you know, you're promoting it for me. <laughs> yeah, well, in my case, it's not so much promoting it, just I do feel that it's an important region. And I know that many, like, for example, Lelani Bauman is, uh, so she will be teaching a course specifically on China next semester. So literally yeah. doing business in China. And so yeah. I figured a book like that could be a nice addition to the course, especially because you can get an electronic copy relatively cheaply. Again, those yeah. who are, uh, I see we have quite a few countries here based on the names. Um, so I know most of the professors here. So so in the United States, for example, the textbook that I use in my own course is like $145. So yeah. it's, it's an expensive textbook, very expensive. In fact, sometimes I feel guilty that the students have to pay so much for the textbook. So if I can get something for $30, $40, $50 dollars as an add-on, that's a very good deal. And yeah. maybe for a course like, you know, teaching, doing business in China, maybe this can become the textbook, maybe yeah. add some readings. So why not? I mean, so it's not so much promotion. It's kind of jumping on the you know opportunity and maybe why not? from someone yeah. who actually is there, but is from the West and so can explain Asia through the eyes of, of a Western person. So it yeah. seems to me like a pretty good deal. And, you know, and the book price is really up to you. you know, so I think you can go up to about $200. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to make it accessible to students. You know, mm -hmm. And it's sort of, remember, I, I've already been in the industry for 25 years before I got an academic. So I, went, I wasn't after the money. It was more of uh, the credential. Um, it was was more important than, uh, than than you know another few dollars out of a book, uh, but that's that's a personal uh, uh, strategy on what's the per you know what's the purpose of using the book. Yeah, yeah it makes perfect sense. Um, one more question in terms of PDF. Going back to PDF, is there a way to create a PDF of the printed book? So in case you want to print some copies uh, sort of locally, if you don't want to pay for the delivery and the print. Uh, That's why you, you got to make the man. So so Kindle doesn't give you that uh, export. They they put it into their own format to go into the. So they, they are protective of that. Um, so that's why you got to make sure the manuscripts the way you want it. You, 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 that you have ownership of that and make sure you you have it the way you want. Don't do a lot of editing in the uh, the, uh, the create Kindle. Mm -hmm. Another question in terms of the copy editing. So did you rely on your own writing skills or did you hire professional um, freelancers who did the, the actual copy editing? I well, know as a non-native speaker, I know for me, but no matter how well, much. No, I, no, I, you know, I, I, did, I did it myself. I had Grammarly. And I also use, through my career in the book, uh, um, my, my wife is actually an editor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I like it for you. Yeah. Back in Canada, actually, uh, my co-author of like a dozen papers, maybe more appears still. So his wife is an editor. So we always would send manuscripts to her. So, th but that's only when I work with him. So, but when yeah. I work on my own, as I said, with Grammarly, I have this executive, whatever, you know, the super premium account. I think everything's perfect. I thought I got it right. And then you send it to a professional and they're like, whoa. Yeah. So you want to well, probably you know, spend money so on Grammarly, that. Grammarly will pick up the, the 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 structure, you know, according to the rules. Mm -hmm. An editor will restructure the sentences. Um, you know, what's the message, Johnny? You're, you're not getting the message across in the right way. Um, and it's a bit of better. You know, I think I got it right. And then my wife just can't completely <laughs> you know, yeah. redoes it. I've you know read everywhere. <laughs> Gordon, we just got a message from Ernesto. Uh, Buongiorno, Ernesto. So he says you already have a new client. He just bought a book of Amazon Kindle. So, <laughs> so you just made $15. <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, it's I, worth I, my time. <laughs> yeah, I'm curious how it works. Uh, so I have Amazon Premium and I have this unlimited, um, um, they call it Amazon Unlimited Books or something like that. And so I noticed that the electronic copy is free to me. So they charge me, I think it's like $150 a year or something like that for the, for the access. And I don't know how they decide which books I get for free, but there are quite a few books that I can just download. And so I'm not sure if they just figure that with the money that I pay per year, it still comes up to about what I would be paying if I bought one by one or some other deal. But I'm curious how it works with the royalties when I use it through my unlimited subscription. So is it still the same deal for you? I guess it's still the same. No, 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 no. It, it changes in terms of your royalties. Mm -hmm. um, so because I went into the global, I went into the 90 day 
uh, program with Amazon that goes into you, what you have as the unlimited. Uh -huh. uh, okay. And uh, basically um, the money you pay for the unlimited goes into a global fund for KDP. So they, uh -huh. they call it the KDP select global fund. Uh, mm -hmm. And they distribute money out of that to the authors. Now, basically what I get paid is about 0 0.005 cents per page. Per page. Uh -huh. Yeah. So if you if you if you download the book and don't even read a page, I get nothing. If you read fifty pages, I get fifty uh, times. So I actually need to go through the pages. Okay, that's very yeah. interesting. Yeah. And so what are you saying is because that's something I never explored. So my unlimited because I never tried to read a book the second time. But so it will expire in ninety days then, or do I still keep my copy forever? Oh, you'll probably be okay. No, my my. Uh, uh, Con contractual agreement to put it into the exclusive program with Kindle is uh -huh. last 90 days. And it lasts as long until I say, no, stop, you know, uh -huh. so. Very uh, interesting. Yeah. So, but yeah, I didn't realize that they pay you per page. So essentially the content that, uh, that delivers, you know, eyeballs essentially. So that's what, that's a very, yeah. I guess it's a fair system. And, and you don't make as much, you don't make as much money on that. So on a full book, I'll get $2 as, uh -huh. as royalty given the number of pages I have, if you read every page. Okay. Very interesting. Uh, so, so by putting in the program, yeah, but it's sort of, a, it helps with the distribution. Um, not everyone is a, uh, a Kindle Unlimited user, um, yeah. but yeah. Ernesto just told me that uh, with the unlimited Kindle Unlimited, I get essentially a rented book. And that makes sense because I think over the years, I've probably downloaded hundreds of them. And I don't think I have that many of them in my library now. So maybe they do expire after you get that exclusive, uh, you know, uh, term yeah. over. Oh, interesting. Good to know. I, I didn't know that, Ernesto. I usually listen to the audio versions. And uh, so, uh, but, but sometimes it's not available in audio. So in that case, I get the Kindle. And often I get, and Ernesto says it's maximum 10 books at one time, because over the years I've downloaded quite a few of them, or is it per year? So I don't know. I need to explore more because yeah. yeah, good to know. Uh, all right. All right. Oh, at one time. So Ernesto says it's like a rental at one time. Could, could vary. Yeah. As I said, I don't use it that often. So, but it's max, maximum 10 at a time. Okay. We have another avid reader and apparently he likes the text version more because he knows <laughs> that more. Good to know, Ernesto. Thank you so much. Um, so the way I judge the quality of the content delivered in the webinar is how many notes I take and how many points I make. I think this is my record. So I have the full page. I'm not sure how visible it is. So it's like literally like two dozen little things that I needed to jot down. Usually it's like five or six. Did we miss anything? So did we cover all of the points? Um, um, so, yeah, you know, I, I think we, we, we cut a lot of territory, you know, and so you, you, you're going to, you do have to play with it a bit, but it isn't that hard to play with, you know? So, um, you know, I, did, I really didn't start you, uh, trying to create, I created the book probably in about two weeks. Mm -hmm. I, you know, the course ended, um, I had the uh, material collecting, so I focused on the manuscript. But when I got to the stage of putting it in the Kindle, um, it went pretty quick. Uh -huh, uh -huh. That's good to know. And so do I understand correctly, just one more time, because we keep getting questions about money. So technically, you don't pay anything, you just put in your work, and then you get paid after this. So they essentially invest all that money, or all that effort and IT solutions and everything in you in hopes that the books will be sold, and they will keep their 40 to 65%, depending on right. the version. Correct. So essentially they do everything for you, but because of that, they keep obviously part of the yeah. proceeds. And, you know, they obviously have an interest in trying to automate the process, pushing out the automation, either, you know, so that's why they created the, the Kindle creates mm -hmm. um, that reduces the amount of rework that they have to do, obviously. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that makes perfect. So, but there, is a lot of, there is a lot of uh, help. So you just may get a bit confused on, they, they have a lot of uh, help instructions, videos, um, created over the past couple of years. Um, Create Kindle only came out over the past uh, year or two. Um, so there's sort of, well, is this instruction applied to Create Kindle or not? So there's a bit of confusion with that, um, but it's, it's just to be aware of that when you, when you go to the website, you, you know, KDP, you know, the Kindle desktop publishing uh, um, website, they have a lot of help, you know, help guidance for you on how to create a book. And so again, just to be reconfirmed, so technically you can publish any book. You said even children's books, it can be big, it can be small. So there is really nothing 
uh, preventing us from, let's say, publishing a book a year. I mean, like we, we oh, spend no. so much time publishing on, for example, LinkedIn or Facebook. Why yeah. not strategically plan it so that each of those posts is a useful story and then package yeah. it as a book? Yes. And you got my strategy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, in fact, now I wish I had a discussion like this with you 10 years ago. By now I would have a few books published. So uh, yeah, I guess you're right. So in, in the end, all that LinkedIn and Facebook can actually be your sort of coach in the box or, you know, motivator or, you know, because it's easy to publish. Well, not easy, but, you know, uh, relatively easy to find some time to sometimes talk about some business stories, for example, if you want to publish a business book or whatever the topic yeah. is. Well, yeah. and, you know, the, the, you, there's, as you said, whatever the topic is, you can, you can, uh, one of the values uh, in my posts is taking a lot of information and consolidating it into a key message. Because, you know, a lot, a lot of books, it, go, it goes on for 10 pages and there was a lot of detail. Well, what's the key thing I need to know? Exactly, exactly, exactly. You can break it down, you know, basically 13, 1300 characters is one page, one full page of yeah, text. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, and, an, and a graphical image to help them because and that's how people people are socialized now to an image and a text and a little bit of text yeah I, as i said you know i know students would love this format because you know nobody wants to read a plain text 40 page chapter but if yeah. you have a picture and a nice story with a nice message yeah i think everybody in fact you know it can even be promoted you know read a story a day finish him in a thick book and you know in a few weeks or something like that so why not well, i call it the spoonful of knowledge a day so that's how i, I distribute my uh, my course uh, and it's active learning and we'll talk more about this on Tuesday yeah. but it's a lot yeah, more active so, learning yeah maybe yes let's then uh, finish this session with the announcement so on Tuesday uh, same time we have another session that I found you know as the topic I found to be fascinating so how do you use LinkedIn to kind of spice up and improve your teaching and so I love that in fact I spent hours by now trying to kind of research Gordon's strategy you know using my own observations but so what he does here is he posts much of the course content on LinkedIn and so that not only improves students you know interest and learning but also I suppose it in, in, improves your or increases your professional network. The students stay in touch with you. So tomorrow they may become your, I don't know, partners, clients, uh, whatnot. The well, students it's, it's how to... Students, yeah, are encouraged to com the students are encouraged to comment on it, to comment, which yeah. increases their ability to get jobs as well. Exactly, uh, exactly. Uh, so, you know, it establishes the positioning of your students in the, in the industry's mind. So exactly. So the students actually benefit from that because they, you know, LinkedIn. Now I know my wife is now trying to apply for a job. She just got her master's degree. And so everybody is going and asking what's your LinkedIn profile. And so yeah. she didn't have one. So everybody was like, what's wrong with you? So now she's trying to create one. So resume is not enough anymore. And yeah. so by, by, by introducing students to LinkedIn, you essentially you know, it's a service to students because without that, they will be disadvantaged. And so by taking your course and by going to LinkedIn instead of, uh, for example, Blackboard for discussions, they build that profile, uh, they, they build that presence. And if they make smart comments, future employers may potentially like them more. And so I guess it's a win-win-win for everybody. So, but we'll talk about that on Tuesday. Uh, so I had a few questions here that, yes, the recording will be available. There are a few people who are late. Uh, so uh, yes, of course, we will do that. And, I'm going um, to give, give the uh, URL to the book yes, in case yes. Went... <laughs> Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, it's in the comments. Yeah. And I will also include that in the description once I post the video on Facebook and YouTube. So uh, very good to know. So, and yeah, if you're teaching a course on, for example, doing business in Asia or international business in general, it might be an interesting addition to your course uh, readings list. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Gordon. Thank you. Uh, I know it's uh, close to midnight in Singapore by now. So it's 10 p.m. I assume, right? <laughs> So uh, up 11. Yeah. <laughs> oh, 11. Okay. Yeah. So it's a winter time. Yeah. Winter time uh, period. Yeah. So thank you so much for staying up with us here and sharing your experience. And uh, hopefully we'll check again in a year or so. And all these people who are watching, hopefully there will be like 10 additional books published on Amazon because of it. <laughs> okay. Thank great. You so much. Amazon should be giving me a commission. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So absolutely. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much. Good night to those of you in Asia and Europe and have a nice day to those of you in the Americas and uh, yeah, good night. Thank Over. you.